thanks to Bangladesh Open Source Network uh, for organizing this uh, celebration. And uh, her will, we have been uh, leading the data science, aka also the data thon segment of the celebration. So at this in in the end of this celebration, uh, we will be uh, presenting some data science talks, and I would uh, love to uh, welcome Professor Dr. Burkhard Rost from the Technical University of Munich, Germany. He is the head of department of computational biology in uh, Technical University of Munich, and he will be giving a talk about artificial intelligence captures language of life written in protein. So uh, a big hand for Professor Rost. Thank you. Burkhard, thank you so much. How are you today? Hello, thank you. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Hanzim. Thank you, Havil. And thank you for having given me your time in my lab and your research energies that started this talk and everything else. So I'm really looking forward to this talk today. I'm a little bit nervous. I just told Tanzim because this is a very different audience and I'm giving a, I'm trying to acknowledge that by giving a very different talk. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. So it's, the, uh, perfect. Uh, the title artificial intelligence captures the language of life as it is written in proteins. And here we are. I have the first issue. Here we go. Uh, so the first point that I want to make is this is an image of a cell. And the way you, so the green thing around it is essentially the membrane that surrounds the cell that separates the cell from the outside of life part. And the inside of the cell essentially is what is happening there. <clears throat> the important point that I want you to take home from this is the cell is not just like a bag of water uh, in which some parts swim around. You see, this is more like a watch. Uh, very, very high density. Many things swimming around or not swimming, being densely packed in the cell. And the thing that actually functions, the function, the machinery of life that is most densely packed, and that does all the function, are the proteins. Shown here is a protein that has become famous over the last uh, year, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. So that is the protein with which the SARS-CoV protein is here that binds to the human ACE2 receptor. And this binding leads to some further downstream reactions. And that binding leads to the virus getting into the cell. Here you see an, a rendering by the artist, David Gutzel. And here you see the more detail in terms of the experimental structure. Now, the way proteins form, you can imagine they are built by a chain, a linear chain of amino acids, and you can think about that like a chain of pearls. And in this chain of pearls, we have 20 different amino acids, and in this chain of pearls, you have 20 different pearls. And they are different in their size, in their color. And the way you arrange them, so the length of the chain can be between 30 pearls or 3,000, or in fact, 30,000 is the longest. This one here has about 1,000 pearls. That's the ballpark figure. And depending on which colors you see, the pearl chain thrown into solvent adopts a unique three-dimensional structure. What that means, the unique three-dimensional structure means you throw it into water that will always do the same three-dimensional structure. It will have always the same shape. And that is very important because in the language of life, the shape relates to function. So the way this looks here decides whether it actually can dock to this blue ACE2. Uh, if it has the right shape, it can bind. It, and if it binds, it can enter the cell and so forth and so on. So all is driven by shape. The shape comes from the sequel, from this pearl chain. Uh, and this is, in fact, exactly what our lab has been doing, predicting from the pearl chains, which we know for 200 million sequences, the structures, which we know for about 100,000 only. <clears throat> and what you see is another uh, particular structure here that is involved in cancer, so-called onco oncogene KRAS, and the slide is, is from Andrea Schapans. Uh, the, you see two main elements. So the ones that wind are helices here, here, the red one, and the blue one here. And then you see these arrows. Uh, they're called strands, it's not important, but those are sort of major elements that shape structures. Now what I'm gonna show you on the next slide is the same protein with one mutant. We all talk, or you hear in the news, you hear talking about mutants of the COVID virus or of the SARS, 
SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this is such a mutant. And I'm just going to show you what this mutant will do. Now, down here, this is in fact the molecule that binds to that protein. So the function of this particular protein is to bind to that molecule in a particular manner, at a particular moment. And the one that has one change, so the red one here is changed, and you actually do not actually really see that it changed, except for this helix here is a little bit different from that helix. You see here the blue is a little bit different from the red, so sometimes there are tiny differences. But in this binding site, this particular change makes a big difference because the binding site changes. And in fact, this one causes cancer. And this is the kind of mutant that we also see in the, uh, in, uh, in the SARS, uh, SARS-2 the virus, in particular in the spike. We, we see it all the, over the place. Now I'm going to show you another protein. In fact, the one underneath here, the yellowish one or lemon one, is the one that is the original from human. And the greenish one is another protein from human that has 15% of its residues changed. So it's not only one change, this is more than 20 changes. And you see that even although there are 20 changes, mostly it still somehow looks alike. And this, in fact, is what we see in evolution, that proteins do not change their shape upon change because being neutral allows the protein in a different organism to maintain function, to do the same thing in some other cell. This is very often you see proteins between human and some cactus may look in their shape very, very similar because on the molecular level of the cell, they actually perform the same or very similar function. And this means that, in fact, their sequences differ, but their shapes look similar. Now, this knowledge of shape or this knowledge of change, when is it for some places you see that change does not change much, for other places you see that the two differ more. So when does change make more difference? When does it make less difference? So less difference you simply see by not seeing anything. You actually see two things overlaid here, but you can only see as if you could only see one. You see a little bit of lemon underneath here. You see here that there are essentially two strands, but they are so similar that you hardly can see the difference. While here, between these two, the, the lemon and the green, you do see a difference. And uh, th this is the point where things change. Now, the question really is, where does this change matter and where doesn't it matter? That information you capture by looking at large families of proteins. So I'm taking this protein from human, I take it from another protein from human that is somehow similar, I take it from mouse, I take it from even fly and even bacteria. For, for KRAS, there's a homolog in bacteria and they all essentially have the same shape and there's a lot of diversity, meaning change in the sequence in the pearl chain. So different pearl chains lead to the same three-dimensional shape. And if I sort of had a profile uh, assembly of all of these changes that are neutral, I could possibly learn something from a tuberculic protein structure. And in fact, this is what uh, we did 30 years ago. We looked at a way of compiling this change inside of a family. Let's not think about the details. So what this actually says is I'm putting in a family of related proteins and they are written down here. So this is the human protein and then this is the, the homolog in mouse and so forth and so on. Uh, in this particular case, so there would be six, uh, the, the human and or five, and sorry, and four others. And at every single position here, I simply put in how often do I see at that point a D? How often do I see at that particular point uh, T or something? That is put into this matrix here, and this matrix is fed into some machine learning device, so-called neural network, to predict secondary structure. Secondary structure is what you saw here, these helices and these strands, and that is what this device predicted. And by the combination of, this is called evolutionary information, so the relation in families, and machine learning devices, artificial intelligence, we would say today, you could achieve a breakthrough performance and this is, in fact, something that has happened in computational biology over the last 30 years. So essentially, we have used artificial intelligence to predict aspects of proteins from these families of proteins. Okay, And one particular way of doing that uh, is a tool that was originally started by Jana Bromberg and then uh, uh, continued by Max and then later by Jonas. Uh, and they, in fact, looked, uh, they developed a tool that can predict 
if I have one of these variants that you talk about, that you hear talk about in uh, COVID, is it going to affect a change or not? Is that one of those that brings change or not? So they developed a machine learning device for that, or uh, there, there have been many de machine learning devices developed for that. And when you have these devices, you can actually look at the differences between people. So Yannick collect, uh, took a data set that was collected by, by a group in Harvard of 60,000 people and all the changes between every pair of them and simply asked how many of these changes actually seem to matter. So for how many of those do we predict an effect and function? And we were very surprised to find that for many we predicted an effect and function. In fact, for many more than we expected. We expected that if you look at healthy individuals, most of the changes between any pair who is listening to me, between you and I, whoever listens to me, uh, will be something that will... Sh there, there are some changes you can appreciate. I look different from you. But actually, there are minor things in the genomic material that are responsible for that. But most of what operates in your cell and my cell is exactly identical. So we would assume that where we differ, and incidentally, we differ in 20,000 amino acids of these pearls. So I, I have... I have 20,000 differences from you or you have 20,000 differences from me, no matter how you look at it. And that's true essentially for everybody you're not related to, which is in fact 1,000 times more than we assumed it would be 10, 10 15 years ago. Uh, and it turns out that many of these variants uh, matter and that many of these that matter seem to be something that is actually not good for us. So through these variants, we carry something that may cause disease but as a population, we, we essentially, why, how come we carry things that cause disease? And most likely the answer to that question is because we're not surviving as individuals. We are surviving as a species. So what may be a challenge for me, if the environmental conditions change, may become an advantage. So nature is just trying out variants that maybe under some constraints will be better. And under other constraints, the individual carrier of that will simply not have a happy life, die out, and the change will not uh, persist in the population, will not be carried into the future. And it seems that many of the changes we have, in fact, are of that, that manner. They are potentially bad for us, uh, but potentially good for something else in society. Anyway, so that's one thing you can do by applying machine learning to this evolutionary information. And that gets me to my first major point that I want to make. In fact, the point of paradigm changes or algorithms uh, through artificial intelligence. And I want to begin with a chess tournament. Uh, and this chess tournament that was played in 1996, Gary Kasparov, one of the grandmasters of chess at the time, played against a computer, Deep Blue, from IBM. And in fact, Gary Kasparov won. A year later, there was a rematch and that was the first time that 1997, so 24 years ago now, uh, it was in four, so 20, 20, 23 years ago, that uh, Grandmaster in chess had lost against a computer. Now, why did he win here and why not here? And every tournament thereafter, computers got better. Why did they get better? Ultimately, it got better because computers got larger. Getting larger helped them. How? Well, this is getting back to uh, the, the, the theme of your, your meeting, uh, Ada Lovelace's first algorithm. In an algorithm, you simply try out, put out a recipe, and the computer is very good at following that recipe. The same in chess. It tries out all possible uh, ways of doing it, and it follows this. Now, when the computer gets bigger, it can do that better. And, you know, by just more CPU time, you get better than a chess champion at some point and then better and better and better and better. Now, this is historically exactly what computing was based on. Big muscle, high machines that can do simple operations very quickly. And that ultimately is completely the idea of an algorithm. That's where the whole thing started. This is what we think about computers. But this is no longer the case. In fact, when you go to a board game that is a little bit more complex than chess, Go, as it is called in, I'm not entirely sure how, which of these versions is the name that is closest to the way you would call it in Bangladesh. Uh, but Go is so complicated that computers can in fact not, like a chess computer, beat the grand champions. Nevertheless, four years ago, a computer beat the grandmaster in Go. 
And that this time was not through what computers typically do by being big enough and trying out possibilities, but that was done through artificial intelligence. In fact, through DeepMind, uh, a company laid off uh, coming out of Google that specialized in the application of artificial intelligence. So this computer this time did not win by trying all possibilities. This computer won by sort of seeing from many tournaments of Go played before, what do people do and what in a particular situation might be the most successful move. And in fact, today when you put uh, play chess in your computer in your little laptop. These chess computer, uh, these chess games are very, very, very good because they are also done by artificial intelligence. So, and that's where we're getting to what I mean: the paradigm change. In the past, computers were these things that did uh, simple operations very quickly. Now, we increasingly become come to this point where computers do artificial intelligence. All the algorithms are changed. So, for instance, uh, I have colleagues that do try to make quadcopters fly autonomously in our institute. And there are particular ways of sort of seeing when you see an environment for a quadcopter, how do you assess your best path through that environment? And there are very simple, straightforward uh, algorithms to do that, that you could do but they take a lot of CPU. A lot of CPU means essentially you have to carry on your quadcopter something that is heavy or send a lot of transmit a lot of data, which again uh, costs a lot of energy. Much simpler way is to learn the terrain by simple artificial intelligence. That costs much less energy to be as a ship on, on this quadcopter. And now people begin to sort of even implement algorithms that we can really do historically in computers completely anew by artificial intelligence simply because it costs less energy, because it's simpler. Uh, and one particular thing you can do with it uh, is something that a uh, course taught by Guy Yagdaf uh, started at TUM. And he, in fact, uh, initially developed a method that with the students together as a course uh, that predicted the odds of survival in Game of Thrones. And that was before the season uh, five started and the predictions, many of these predictions turned out to be right in that season. The way that had been fed essentially is by sort of seeping data from the internet, particularly a Wikipedia page of, of Game of Thrones, but also social networks. So how people talk about a Game of Thrones, that's sort of what the system learned and it could come very far. Uh, incidentally, there, there was sort of a re remake a few years later before the final season guy essentially predicted who would survive the longest. And that prediction, and certainly it, many things came true that were predicted, but the final winner was not correctly predicted. Uh, and there's a, there's, there's a few things to be said about that. Anyway, so you can do all kinds of things with artificial intelligence. Uh, and you're aware of that, and I'm sort of hanging. Um, but let me turn to a different theme. Uh, and the different theme is essentially machine learning. If there's anybody, I, I'm sorry, I do not see the chat. Uh, if anybody wants to interrupt me, uh, please go ahead and do. Um, but machine learning is understanding, I claim, in the 21st century. Uh, and I am hanging again. Um, let's begin with something else. Prediction is the asset test of understanding. So if you cannot predict something, then I claim you can, do not understand. Whatever is, whenever people say prediction is difficult, in particular prediction of the future, well, if we understand the phenomenon, if we sort of do signs, that's the minimal thing we have to do in order to prove that we understand. Now the question becomes, is that also true when our, predict our understanding or our prediction is based on machine learning, artificial intelligence. There's a very long story and I don't want to get into that story. Many people would argue no, I would argue yes, and I believe the truth is like always, somewhere in between these two extremes. Uh, but clearly we can learn from artificial intelligence and the model they create a lot about biology, about computational biology, about protein structures and about protein function. Uh, 
And we can learn things that we did not put into those models. So clearly those models have learned, and that's a theme that I get back into later. Now, one theme or one understanding that many people have, machine learning is like a black box. It's like black magic. There is, you, you have some box into which you put some data and some prediction comes out of it, but you don't understand what happened in between. That, in fact, is something that you hear many people talk about, even people who do machine learning themselves. Now, this is total bogus, utter nonsense. Uh, the fact that tons of very well-known people say it does not reduce the nonsense. The reason is machine learning models are complex because they, max, they, they match the complexity of a problem. So what I'm trying to say is people say that these black boxes we don't understand because we cannot get the rules out. That's wrong. You can get the rules out. Once you get the rules out, however, and that today is known under understandable AI and is a la has become a large research area and is an important research area. But basically the point here is that when people try to extract the rules that the box has learned, what they see is that these rules are complex, that these rules, in fact, don't make sense. So getting back into that tool that I showed you before, that was the first that predicts secondary structure. So 30 years ago, when I developed that, I in fact sort of tried to look into the black box. And then I found rules such as if there is an A next to a C, and then the conservation is this and blah, 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 then it's a helix to 60%. This is not the rule that we can handle. It's not a rule to, that we can look at and say, yes, that's true. The system also extracted these rules and they looked like essentially, yes, this is true. But those rules are not good enough to predict secondary structure at a high level of accuracy. Those rules are good enough to predict something. But if the system has to learn more than something, if the system has to do it better than something, then the only way it can do it is to extract rules that are so complex that we cannot grasp them. That does not mean that there is no understanding in there. In fact, it means that we apply this machine, that we apply artificial intelligence exactly for the cases that are not simple. And it's a mistake. Is there somebody asking a question? No. Uh, and ultimately, the rules cannot be simple if you, if you solve a complex problem. As simple as that. And that is what people misunderstand as these are black boxes. They are not. One thing that is very important is the way you handle the data or you come from using the data that you know to predicting the future. The way you typically do that in machine learning is say this pi here were to be the entire data that you have available. You take some fraction of this pi, say this Pac-Man here, you take that fraction and you learn, you build your model, you train, and you take another part, the piece that is left out here, the pie, the piece of the pie, uh, the cake that you want to eat later, you hide under the table. And what you have hidden under the table, once you have optimized your system, once you say that this is in fact the method that I have, and now I can predict the future, then you take that out of the table and you look at it and ask, can I now, if I pretend that this one here is the future, can I predict the future? Now, you knew this one and you could sort of glimpse uh, could pretend this is my solution, but let's look under the table. And this is one of the complications why things very often go wrong. In fact, the story is slightly more complicated. You need to sort of rotate around. You need uh, more hiding than the, the simple version. That is also not enough. You need to cluster. And this clustering is something that is very intuitive in biology and comes from computational biology. In computational biology, we have a lot of experience with that. But this is, as I'm going to give you some examples later, something that hits us in everyday life much worse, or as well, how meta, how you want to, to, to phrase it. And ultimately, the point here is that some proteins are more related to this group here. This is one family, that's another family, that's another family, and that's the third family here, the blue ones, and they have to sort of group, be grouped together. And if you, you cannot pick out one from here and hide it under the table. If you hide something under the table, you have to hide this whole thing under the table or this whole thing or this whole thing. So you have to hide them in groups. Uh, 
you have to recognize that there are some trivial relations and some non-trivial relations so that the non-trivial ones are what you want to learn and this is sort of family clustering and this is what i'm going to get back to uh, in, in different examples later this is still not enough you need to use some other data sets and there's a much longer story underneath and it's it's not relevant the most important point that i want to make uh, in computational biology we have been developing tools that use machine learning over 30 years and every one of these cases is such that people have been using them for years so I've developed uh, methods that were written 30 years ago and are still in use today. So there are hundreds of people every day using those methods still. Uh, and this is in fact something that puts a high pressure on you to predict how well you do 30 years ago. Otherwise for 30 years you're going to be wrong. Or people are going to shout at you, you claim that this is true and it's not true. In most other applications of machine learning, well, let's just look at some simple things like, like face recognition. Next year, there's going to be a new tool available because the software has evolved, the hardware has evolved, the data has changed. In our field, that has not been like that. And again, there, there is a longer answer for why that is so. But the upshot of that, the advantage of that is we got to learn to handle bias in the data. And there are many steps that you have to pursue. And in some sense, therefore, computational biology can teach others who apply machine learning at this point in society, some lessons about how to handle data. Now, let me talk about this theme that I announced in the title, the language of life theme, modeling the language of life. And it comes from Ahmed El Nagar uh, and Michael Heinzinger, and thanks to Ideas and Slides, in particular to, to Michael Heinzinger here. Sorry, this is a complex slide. Let me just point out, don't look too much at this slide. Um, now, with artificial intelligence, so, Let's go back 30 years um, and let me go. This slide is easier to parse. Uh, so when you go back 30 years, then people try to use artificial intelligence to understand text and the way or languages. And the way they did that is essentially they programmed a lot of grammar into the machine learning devices. So the machine learning devices looked at texts, but they also learned grammar. The modern approach is you look at text and understanding, understand the grammar through the text. And that's the idea. One of the many devices, they're called language models, is ELMO, uh, embeddings from languages models. And essentially what it does is, let's just look at the input here, let's stick to. The system tries to predict what the next word in a sentence is. So it comes, is triggered by three input words. Let's stick to three words. Uh, and you want to predict which out of a big dictionary of possible words is the most likely one to come next. In this particular case here, say it's improvisation. Okay. And now we take the same sort of language model. And rather than using sentences, we use our protein sequence where every letter corresponds in the natural language processing to a word. Now it is an amino acid. And just like we predict in the word the next word, we predict the next amino acid. So if you sit an S, you want to predict the E. If you sit an E, you want to predict the Q, and so forth and so on. So the machine essentially learns to predict the next letter in a protein sequence. What can you do with that? Well, with itself, this has no value. So predicting the next word in a sentence, you immediately understand how you can use that. This is useless. But we can ask, the system has learned something. In, in the, all of these connections here, there is some information about how language is written. And in fact, in this model is something written that contains grammar. The system here has completely learned the grammar intrinsically through the sentences it has been fed with. Uh, the beauty of the system here, I can feed it with a lot of sequences without any annotation. So one problem that we have in the field is we have a lot of sequences. I said 200 million. We have very few with annotations, for instance, for which we know the 3D structure. That's 100,000. 100,000 is a big number, but compared to 200 million, it's a small number. Um, and ultimately, the hope is that the grammar of going from one to the other is somehow learned in this model. 
Well, is it true or not? We can read out what has that system learned. And this is again like the black box. We open the black box and ask what's inside. And so essentially we look at this and inside we see some classification. In this particular case, the system has learned to distinguish between proteins that are in the membrane. Remember I showed you the cell, the outside was green, so that's the membrane that surrounds the cell. And what is not in the membrane? So that membrane is blue, is red, and the other one is blue. Okay, what we see is it's not, you don't see a, a very good separation between red and blue. But the system that was used here has never, it never learned anything about red and blue. It only learned sequence. It never learned anything about membrane. It has no idea. So in the context of grammar, I would call a membrane a grammatical an element of grammar, such as a subject or a noun or whatever you want to know when you look at. Uh, and all of this knowledge is implicit there. Yes, there is not a clear separation between red and blue, but there is some separation. There is something that the system has learned. And in fact, there is a sort of more recent way, a bird that does something like like what I showed you before, let's stick in this sketch to uh, to improvising. In this particular case, it does not learn the next word. It sort of masks some word out. So it in fact sees the sentence, let's stick to in the sketch. And there's a masked word here. And from this masked word, it has to create, uh, find out that this is improvising. Okay, uh, that is essentially the same thing as before. It's a bigger model, therefore, thereby can learn a little bit more. When we apply that to proteins, uh, we can in fact do some more complex uh, classifications. In this particular case, complex classifications you see in green bacteria, in blue, eukaryotes. So eukaryotes are all the types of cells. Our cells are eukaryotic cells. Bacterial cells, you know, viruses, you know, viruses are orange here, they are sort of in between. There's a reason because some viruses are in bacteria, some viruses are in eukaryote, and they are most similar to wherever they are from. RK bacteria is sort of an older bacteria sort, uh, it's also separated. But you really see blue, and I'm sorry for those of you who cannot distinguish between uh, blue and green, uh, the line is somewhere, this is sort of green, and up here is all blue. The point is, that the system has learned something about the organism or the type of species. And that's remarkable because again, that has never been put into the system. Now, since it learned something like that, uh, we can also look at the inside of what it has learned and predict aspects of structure and function with it. And we have so far in many cases succeeded. In some cases, we actually do better than the state of the art. In others, we are slightly less accurate than the state of the art that uses evolutionary information. But we are getting very, very close. And this implies that we are sort of understanding more and more of the grammar of the language of life. I call it the language of life because proteins are the machinery of life and they are written in the language of amino acids that we can just write as letters. And from that language, essentially we can read out features such as function such a structure. And that is remarkable that these systems can learn that without having been taught directly. So the information is there. And this is a remarkable moment because this is something that is you see in the publication dates here, 2019, 2020, that's happening just now. Two, three, four years ago, I would not have expected that at all. It's not that we have been working on this for decades and uh, and put many things together. I have many research projects that have been working on for decades uh, and have been trying to put results together. But this is really something rather sudden and it comes from the immense advance of the artificial intelligence algorithms. And that gets us into this theme of bias. Uh, bias and thanks to ideas and slides here from Chris uh, Delago. Uh, Let's just talk about GPT-3. So this is a natural language processing model that everybody talks about is from, from Google, as huge as a trillion parameters, or maybe some of you have seen OpenAI's DALI. DALI is a thing, a machine artificial intelligence to which you give some sentences such as this one here, an armchair in the shape of, shape of an avocado. And all of these here are renderings of the EI DALI. So this is what DALI does by given these, any of these two sentences, right? It does not create one answer. There are many, I mean, 
many, many, many more. It's just a, an excerpt of all the possible answer. But the, the statement essentially is it creates plausible images from literally anything you can ask it. Anything you can put into a sentence, into an English sentence, it will draw. Full stop. Or at least have some association, draw some association to that. And that's remarkable. Um, now, there is, uh, in GPT-3, I should have said, this is essentially what you see in terms of language uh, recognition. This is why Google Translate works so good today. Uh, or this is one of the reasons behind Google Translate working so well. This is one of the reasons that automatic text recognition works so much better today than 10 years ago. That is EI. And that is EI with a lot of free parameters. How many free parameters are needed? And there we get into a new kind of debate that is not about bias, but that is about the carbon footprint. Uh, this GPT-3 is like driving from the moon to the moon and back. And the question, of course, is that is that adequate? Or are we burning too much on the NLP models? Are these models getting so big that they do things that are no longer on the same scale. Another breakthrough that happened in our field just a month ago, uh, or let's say six weeks ago, is AlphaFold 2, uh, also out of DeepMind. It's the first time in history that a machine or that some algorithm can predict protein structure for many proteins uh, at levels that are very, very, very good. So creating that kind of image experimentally, I didn't say that, uh, I showed you many of these images, making one of those essentially costs hundred thousand dollars. I mean, not to make the image, but to get the experiment that resolves, that shows that the structure of a shape of a protein is exactly that. It costs about ballpark a hundred thousand, hundred K, hundred thousand dollars. This image here from, from Google took much more. To, uh, the, the price was much higher. Um, so if every one of these computed structures that are now so good is as expensive as the experimental structure, what is the value? So there are all kinds of, of questions in that direction. Uh, but I want to go more in terms of bias. Um, so you can all read the, the story that I put up here. And I'm going to pause a little bit. Uh, is there anybody, and I want input from you, uh, while I do see um, this the, the chat, and I do see that there's not much going on in the chat, uh, I'd like somebody to, somebody, by my question or my, my request to you, if you do not, if you have never seen that before, what you can read in front of you, if you have never seen those data before, can you come up with a suspicion how to explain that story. And there is no ghost involved here. There is no grandfather. There is no a second father, second marriage. It's a straight story. It's a very straight, simple family. Is anybody here who sort of can guess what the answer to that story is? Please speak up. Hello. Yeah. Oh, the, oh, yes, Janet. Yeah. Dedan, 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 Dedan Gibai. Hi, Dedan. How are you doing? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? So, do you uh, know the solution? Yes, I do. Uh, okay. The, the doctor. But I said that somebody who doesn't know the answer. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> so, those of you who look at the hey, hi, Janet. Um, Hello. Pleasure <laughs> to, to, to see you in that. You, but you're cheating, right? Me? Why? <laughs> Did you know that before? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this is this is my my, my my way of calling it cheating. So there are publications uh, of this. In fact, uh, Deborah Bell is is one of the people who sort of came up with this issue and has been it's researching. It's a great it. example of of bias. It's a totally great example. So the, for those of you who still have not seen uh, the answer here, of course, the doctor is a woman. Uh, the doctor is the mother. And I have, I have not been able to solve this problem. Uh, in fact, I, so I, I saw this, uh, I've seen that for the first time a few, few weeks ago. And I do not know how many handful of people I have given. Only one so far has solved it. And that, in fact, was, was, was not a girl. Um, anyway, so let's turn that around. If, if I had not given this to you, but that, right, you would have immediately been able to say it. 
uh, or this would not have been, this is sort of the same bias the other way around. Uh, in this particular case, nobody would have said where, I mean, everybody would have reacted. Yeah, so what, right? Where, where, where's your story? I mean, why why is that relevant here? Uh, because nobody would ever think about a male nurse. Uh, in that sense, this is sort of the bias the other way around. Uh, there has been recently, some of you may have seen that, this uh, credit discriminating gender story where, in fact, a credit card from a woman was uh, bounced uh, and ultimately there was something that was is related to the fact uh, that she was a woman uh, her, her credit or the, the woman credit was different from the male credit the female credit was different from the male credit and that ultimately uh, is making Google, uh, Apple in this particular case change the way they do things so this is a bias uh, and this is we have tons of these biases uh, Caroline Perez uh, wrote a book, Invisible Woman. And in this book, there are many, many examples. Uh, for instance, uh, women are more, much more likely to be disc misdiagnosed uh, after heart attack. Uh, they are more likely to be hurt in a car accident simply because cars are optimized from the male body. Uh, they're more often hired in, uh, after blind editions when nobody knows it's a woman. Uh, and in science, there are so many others. Uh, you, for instance, if the moment at ICB, and Janet is a perfect example for that, uh, you include more women and in, uh, the story gets more impl uh, inclusive. So the club changed to something to, instead of an old man's club, it becomes a place where things are done. Uh, one way of doing that is to have separate speaker lists to have a list for women speakers and male speakers. Uh, what we are now doing is separate applicant lists. So when we have applications for professor positions, uh, we have one for women and, and one for men, and we simply separate them out to, to avoid that, that then in the end. So this, this separation of the list, in the end, we bring them together. And then there's a, it's a higher chance to, to get women into the game. There are many of these examples. Many things have to be done. Uh, and we have to be all more active. Here is an example for bias. It's a genomic catalog of the Earth microbiome that has been published relatively recently. And when you look at this map here, uh, you may sort of look at Bangladesh and see that, that there, there are not many, many, many points in Bangla Bangladesh uh, in the microbiome. Uh, and ultimately, what I want to say here is uh, this is announced as Earth's microbiome. But of course, they are highly biased by the way these things are collected, the way these things can be measured, the way they can be transported, and, and, and. So there is a bias. Uh, and there are many, many of these biases. Here is one about the human gut microbiome. Uh, by the way, in this particular case, uh, Bangladesh is, is as good uh, as, as many European countries. Uh, but anyway, so there, there clearly is a bias. And uh, Timit Gebru is one of these people who sort of advertise this issue that we have to improve, uh, this issue of bias that we have to change, we have to address. And I believe there are many things in which we have to address them, in which we can address them. And one ultimately is getting back to uh, what I talked about in computational biology, family clustering. So you have to learn to understand what is it that you have to cluster together and keep out for artificial intelligence clustering, right? And this is highly non-trivial. So if you have face recognition, uh, should you put particular countries into particular pots? Or should you put particular groups into particular pots? How to group? And this is something we have to sort out. But this is something th that is the challenge to go forward. And from computational biology, we can tell you there is a way to address all of that. Uh, it may not be that simple, but it is always doable. And we get to something else. There's the problem. Where is the bias? Where does it come from? When you query Google with the explanation, it's the data, not the algorithm. You find many people, the internet is full of answers, very important people who understand artificial intelligence, who understand everything about the whole game. They clearly say it's the data, not the algorithm. In computational biology, we say, this is not true. It's the algorithm, not the data. Because in our field, we have data given. We, we don't have the luxury to play with the data. We don't have the luxury to say, people go back and measure your data in a different way. We have what we have.
And this is a typical example here. Uh, and this, in fact, is a, uh, the, the data that we collected for binding site prediction or in, uh, for effect prediction here. The blue is neutral, the red is effect. So this tiny bit is the one that we are most interested in. And then you can learn to, in fact, use the data that has so little red and still develop a method that completely understands what red means. Okay, And that is challenging. But from, from computational biology, you can also learn it's doable. It's not impossible at all. You can do that. It, I'm not trying to say it's the algorithm, not the data, but it certainly is not clearly the data, it's not the algorithm. Like always in life, it's neither black nor white, it's neither one nor the other, it's the two together. But we can use the data that is there. That is sort of the, the positive message from us. The, Important thing I believe in life always is not to forget that science is communication. It's communication between nature and us. It is communication between us. And communication also has to do with the way you present your science. Uh, and here is a paper from Maria and, and Katharina uh, that is about the validity of machine learning uh, is increased if you sort of connect people from different expertise. The more expertise you bring together, the better. Networking, ultimately. Uh, so artificial intelligence and machine learning is essential for computational biology and bioinformatics, has been essential for 30 years. Um, now, in fact, it begins, AI begins to unravel the language of life as written in proteins. And computational biology has learned to handle the bias in the data. And that is sort of a very good news for what we have at the moment. In some sense, it means we only have to become aware and do a lot to prevent it. So the solution is not simple. I've been working on this 30 years. I give a lecture uh, every semester. And most of the time, I'm talking about bias in computational biology. And most of the time, when things go wrong, they go wrong because people forget about the bias, no matter how often I talk about it. So this will be the same for face recognition. This will be the same for health data and, and everywhere. But we have to learn to handle it, then we can. We have to learn to accept it. Uh, and that brings me to another thing that we have to learn in sort of staying open, staying aware, uh, keeping your scientific perspective. What I'm showing you on the x-axis here is the year, on the y-axis is, is number of, of babies, uh, born and there, I'm, I'm, I, unfortunately, uh, I, this slide is sort of. I made a mistake in this slide, so you're not supposed to see this part here. Okay, this is the number of babies born in one particular regions in Lower Saxony. Okay, over this time, uh, on the next slide you see the number of storks uh, in the same period, in this essentially the same region. Uh, some of you may have heard about this idea that the stork brings the baby to the mother. Uh, most of you, I take it, would not quite believe in this explanation of reality. Nevertheless, this is a correlation depending on your field. I come from computational biology. In computational biology, this is an extremely good correlation. The point that I want to make here is I don't want to make the point that I, I now have uh, convincing data that the babies come from the storm. This is sort of not my point. My point is be aware, be awake, sort of try to see in whatever you look at, punch holes into that, see whether in fact what is suggested is really explained. So yes, here is a correlation, but it is a random correlation. So you can always find two events that are somehow correlated. You, I, it is just happens to be that this is a particular region in Lower Germany. I would pick another one in Lower Germany and I would not see that correlation. The story only becomes a correlation if I see that in many, many, many similar stories. And also, it could be that I put something completely different. I find whatever I put down here in the axis as something that correlates most optimally with this. And then I say, that seems to suggest nonsense. The question is what made me select it. That awareness, keep it. Stay curious, stay connected. So ultimately, I believe the best, most important thing in life is to stay connected um, and dream big. So small dreams are not worth following.
dream big and then follow those. And I'm sort of giving it with this image that is in fact the largest organism on earth, the honey fungus, over 3000 years old, uh, which is over nine square kilometers uh, and is over 35,000 tons heavy, one single organism. And it can do that only because it stays connected. Thanks to Herville, thanks to many people, uh, Janet, <laughs> you happen to be on the call. Uh, thanks to my group, Tanzim, to your time in my lab for bringing me here and for you guys to from, from her will to, to do these efforts. Uh, I really feel that more women in technology and science will help us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Burkert. Thank you, Burkert. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was an awesome talk. Uh, thanks uh, for mentioning uh, her will. Uh, the whole conference is organized by Bangladesh Open Source Network. So also like a, a very big hand uh, to uh, Bangladesh Open Source Network. Um, I would like to um, uh, hand over to uh, Farhana Hassan, um, uh, the founder and CEO of Her Will. She would like to say a few words to you, Burkhard. Um, please, uh, uh, Farhana Hassan, ma'am, could you please say something? Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tanzim. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross. Uh, we were blown away when we heard about you by Tanzim and then when we read about you, the, uh, whatever we could find in our research. And then I'm just mesmerized by your talk and I cannot thank you enough for gracing us with, our, with your presence today. And uh, this is just such a beautiful um, presentation you gave us. It's eye-opening. Um, her will, uh, yes, I had the audacity to found her will uh, actually a few months ago and uh, we dream big and uh, work hard and as you said stay connected that's what we're doing we're building a one-stop resource for highly talented women to be more successful at every stage of life and leadership so please be with us and uh, guide us through the to, through this uh, arduous path. It's 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 tough and it's um, it's taking every drop of our blood, sweat, and uh, tears. But uh, thank you. We're thank you, here. thank you, everybody, for 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 us doing that. I really really appreciate. It. Uh, from my perspective, you only contribute to making it easier for me. Thank you. I I would also uh, like to mention uh, Dr. Nova Ahmed. Um, since we're thanking everyone, uh, I would really like to take this uh, opportunity to thank you, Dr. Nova Ahmed. Uh, Burkert, uh, Dr. Nova Ahmed, uh, she is the organizational chair of uh, Bangladesh uh, Open Source Network, and she organized this uh, um, conference. Um, uh, well, it's a joint collaboration uh, with Dr. Nova Ahmed and um, uh, well, uh, also Muni Hassan, uh, star from uh, Bangladesh Open Source Network. Um, yes, of course, like uh, without this cooperation, this thing wouldn't have happened. It would have been possible. And uh, yeah. Uh, so, Burkard, um, uh, just to uh, say, uh, are you taking questions from us? Okay. Sure. So, anyone, anyone, any questions? And I would also like to say that um, when I was looking at the participants list, I was really um surprised to uh discover some familiar names i was like i, I didn't actually even invite them they just somehow the, the word got out and and i was really surprised to see uh them as well here i think uh some uh, from germany from usa and i don't know from where else uh, from the world um if you have any questions this is your chance I mean, I don't know how often you can get Professor Rost here. <laughs> uh, ask away, please, any questions or uh, whatever you want to know, please. Hi. I have a question, Professor Ross. This is me, Nova, from Bangladesh. Uh, so uh, when we uh, do work with large computational sciences, the bias is a big challenge, especially when we are coming to countries like ours. So. Uh, this actually shows the big divide in terms of data. Um, so, um, uh, particularly when we are looking at uh, 
uh, ethics and AI and the data itself. And uh, on top of it, another problem is we don't have very good data protection laws like you have in Europe in, through GDPR. We don't have that. So it depends on the person or depends on the group when we are working on it. Do you have any suggestions for that or anything that we should, as we will be talking about policy level intervention after all this discussion. So it's a good chance for us to have your opinion. Thank you. Um, so I'd rather not answer to that one. And this oh. gets me into a terrain that I find uh, complicated. So let's, let's begin yeah. from the back. Uh, okay. My impression always is Let's begin from understanding you have your data. Your data is you, your data is your value. So you, you are way too defensive. You, you, your data is important as my data, is as important as my data. There's nothing that I have that you don't have. So stand up and, and just be happy about having your data with your bias, because that is who you are. And this, this is something that is fantastic, right? So be aware, be proud and, and enjoy it. Don't be so defensive. Now we, you get to the law story. I'm uh, deliberately not a lawyer. One way of saying that I, I get less money, uh, but this is also something that is not part of my job. So I can tell you the, the more power to the lawyer, the less likely your, your disease will be cured, right? Uh, if there's no availability of any information about any disease for anybody, then there will be no cure of any disease for anybody. So if the disease would have stayed in Wu, or if the sequence of COVID would have stayed in Wuhan, uh, then there would be no vaccine. And this, this is one of those stories that is about openness. I believe in openness. I believe in, in open data. I believe in making data rather more open than rather protecting them. In particular, for instance, health data. So we're sitting here in Germany, We have, in my view, we have a particular problem with the fact that we have too many laws uh, concerning the data security. There, for instance, is a, is a country, there are countries around us, such as Denmark, who have a slightly different situation about the way they handle data. And in many ways, they are advanced in terms of the way they treat their health records. And that ultimately leads to an advance in the treatment for every single person. So sometimes openness of data is going to deliver more advantage to the user. I completely understand this is not how many people see that. And I'm living in a country where many people are more scared of open data than I am. Uh, so I cannot cannot give you any advice in any way, uh, yeah. except for... I, I think don't, open don't... data is the way to go as well. But I mean, for privacy reason, we don't have very good, uh, I mean, privacy related uh, laws here, how to protect the, I mean, how to anonymize it. So if anybody uh, misuses it, uh, we don't have any protection here. So that's that's the challenge probably. Okay, but I'm, I'm saying something that I'm not saying. Is that recorded yeah. here? I think so. It's oh, then, I'm not, then I'm not going to say Probably, it. Uh, yes. Sorry, I'm really sorry to get um, you this. No, 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 but um, the, the, the point is, is, let's put it differently. As long as you don't have a prediction, you, you have access to your data, right? Enjoy that moment. Okay, yeah, maybe, maybe a different discussion when it's a privacy group. Yeah, I mean, because, yeah, okay. So again, I, I, I understand that you're worried. I believe it, it speaks for you that you're worried. Uh, but I believe when you, you, so the, you see my lesson is understand your data, play around with your data, but not make it close, don't close it up first. First understand it and then see where the bias is. And then when you see where the bias is, then you can correct it. But if you sort of start the whole thing by saying, I'm not gonna look at my data because I don't have the right to do that or, I'm worried about that, then things get complicated. Um, now, it is also the, but I, I'd rather not go, go down that rabbit hole, if you, if you allow me. Yeah. I'm, I'm very open for other questions, but not, none that get me into legal debates. So any questions from the participants? Would love to hear how you enjoyed the talk. It's it's a good chance to thank the professor as well. It was interesting um, to see how your example 
uh, didn't get any traction here on a, a women's empowerment platform. <laughs> you see, and this is this is the point. I have, in fact, I asked several female doctors. Uh, yeah. I, I asked uh, um, at this point five women who are doctors did not give the answer right, uh, and three who want to become doctors and are female didn't. So. We all. This is this is totally right. We we all we all suffer from the same bias. Yeah. But then at the end, you know, Janet was cheating, but Janet at least is a woman. She. <laughs> so the answer in, in the in the uh, in the chat that was from Janet, right? And Dedan, well, Dedan also, but they both knew. But yes, yeah, true. Too, but she didn't say anything. Good for you. <laughs> I knew, yeah, but I because you said like it would it would be cheating, so uh, of course I didn't say because your question was uh, can anyone answer the question if they haven't if they ha haven't seen the question before? So, yeah, that that was a very interesting point. Um, uh, 2019, I was um, in the European Women in Tech conference in Amsterdam. Uh, there was a panel discussion about uh, this this kind of bias and discrimination. So, you know, those uh, ear pods that Apple uh, invented, introduced a couple of years ago. So they didn't actually take the women population into account because whenever I would wear a hula, a, a hoop rings, long rings, so and I put the AirPods in my ears, so they've got magnets in them. So what happens? The rings would just jump this way. So this is completely, uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's the bias. That's the bias in the data, and they didn't. And right. of course, like the Google prediction about, uh, um, uh, you know, like. Um, the credibility of asking for a credit of yeah that definitely and sure yeah so there's another <laughs> question from dr karishma choudhury she's a, pro a professor at leeds university uk i don't know uh, if she can ask her for herself let me read it out to you i work with big data and mobility and have the same issue regarding bias i was wondering if having a small data which we know is unbiased is useful to identify the bias in the big data Absolutely. So this is this is this is this is a, if you know about that. So if you do have a small data set that is unbiased, then you are in a perfect position because then you can already see whether the data that is unbiased is in its complete set uh, predicted equally well or badly. And that ultimately, yes, this is exactly the kind of what I would call a jewel set to have. This is a, this is a nugget. No matter, well, again, so the story gets slightly more complicated. You say small. If it is so small that you, at the end of the day, come to the point where you cannot make any statement because of statistical significance, because it's so small, I mean, let's just be extreme, one data point, right? One unbiased data point, not going to help you. So how big does it have to be? So you need some minimal size. But in principle, this is exactly the way to go and to sort of try to have a bunch of these isolated corners that you can say, here I know, here I know. Let's just see how my answer fits to that and fits to that. Yes. Yes. 